guys, welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we've got a really cool guest uh, for you guys lined up. We've got Nick Stake. Now, Nick is a lead detective on an agency out west. We're just going to leave it as that because obviously you guys know that when we get guys, especially active duty guys out here like this, um, we got to kind of leave the details out sometimes. But I met Nick over at the Ed Cauldron lock picking, Ed Cauldron slash Sear Pick lock picking um, class course. And it was, it was badass. Me and Nick got paired up and uh, we did some really cool stuff as far as, you know, learning how to kind of case a joint, so to speak, or if you're speaking with executive protection terminology, like doing advance or, you know, stuff like that. And uh, it came out that Nick, you're, you're a detective and I started fucking firing questions at you, man. And you were really, it was, it was a pleasure to work with you because you were telling me all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't have thought of on my own. So before we get too much uh, more into that, Nick, welcome on to the podcast. Thanks for coming on, bro. Thanks for having me. So um, I, I really want to just kind of jump in here uh, with, with both feet and ask you just right off the bat, man, um, what is life like as a detective? I know that you're pretty freaking busy right now. So um, run us through kind of on a normal day, if you can even say there is normal days. On a normal day, what, do you, what are you doing? Uh, so for me, because I work at a rural agency and it's a little bit of a smaller agency, uh, I do everything from the CSI work all the way up to leading the major investigations. So um, uh, when I'm handling a case, I'll have to do the, the crime scene work and then turn right back around, interview victims, witnesses, suspects, that kind of things, uh, those type of things. And then also uh, just manage the case in general, plus the other detectives working with me. So uh with that comes a lot of unpredictability. I thought when I got into detectives, it was going to be a little bit more stable, more of a nine to five type of job. Uh, and it just hasn't been that way. Uh, I've been doing it for six years now, and it's just been the wildest time in my career. I would imagine there's a large degree of unpredictability. Uh, it sounds like Wall Street hours to me, to be honest, where you're just always in the office working. Um, and I mean, I, I did private detective work for a little while, and that was actually fairly similar where you thought it was going to be kind of more of a stable thing and it was the complete opposite. Do you guys do much surveillance and things like that um, on the job? Uh, some of the cases I've had, we've done quite a bit. Uh, that's something uh, I'd say the vast majority, probably 90% of our cases, we don't have to do a lot of surveillance with just with the type of cases we're getting right now. Um, but when we do have that other 10% of the cases that we're doing surveillance on, it's uh, it's pretty intense. You know, you're going at it for, uh, you know, days, weeks, and that's all you're doing. Now, when you're doing surveillance, are you guys parked in a static location, kind of watching a house or a building, or are you kind of more on the move following around actively? Uh, just kind of all of the above. It, it depends. Yeah. It's got to be a toolbox and you use what you need to. Sure. Sure. And that's, I mean, that's always fascinating, especially to us here at Gutter Fighting Secrets. You know, we're all about the trade craft and the James Bond type of stuff. Um, without giving anything away, uh, is there anything in particular that you kind of like to utilize from your toolbox when you're doing a surveillance type job? Uh, uh, simplest is always best. I think uh, the, the movies kind of portray things one way, and I, I don't think it's really that way in real life. Um, but I can't really give you a specific thing that like works every time. Uh, it just kind of depends on what case we're working and what the objective of that, of that, uh, uh, you know, part particular surveillance operation would be. So uh, I, I would say uh, it's a lot of creativity, to be honest with you, I think, in my personal opinion, um, you know, and uh, just blending. Yeah. And you bring up blending, which is, I'm glad you did, because <clears throat> that was going to be my next question. Is there anything that you found in particular that, I mean, for blending in, because I see a lot of cops out there, and a lot of private guys as well, and they got their 511 pants on and they got their, you know, tactical shirts and stuff. And, it, you know, it, it makes you stand out. Is there anything specifically that you kind of try to um, dress with or wear in particular when you're when you're doing something like that? Uh, yeah, well, as you could tell, I'm wearing just about everything you just described. So <laughs> um, I, I, I don't shake that very easy. So I prefer to. Uh, do as much as I can from a distance. That way I don't have to deal with that. But when I do, it's, um, you know, just getting stuff. I, I, I guess I'm not trying super hard to blend in, just throw in a hoodie and, and uh, 
mainly I just don't act like what I am. I think that's the, the big thing is, is just acting differently. Well, when I first met you, man, I honestly wouldn't have guessed that you were a detective. I wouldn't have even guessed you were in law enforcement, which is a little atypical, I think. And it, it I think, lends itself well to the fact that you are a detective and it, it lends itself well to blending in. Um, maybe I would have guessed Marine or something like that, but it, it is a, a personality thing, I think, as well. What do you think your, do you think your personality kind of lends itself well to what you do? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the job kind of picks the, picks the person to do it, mm. so to speak. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't have put you in that position of being a lead detective if you weren't on point with it. I, I would like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't have, uh, if you would have talked to the, the much younger version of me in the academy, I, although I wanted to be in detectives, I don't think I would have ended up where I would have never guessed I, I'd end up where I am today, to be honest with you. And that's always the case with careers, man. Uh, I know that you started off in the jail uh, as, I believe, a sheriff's deputy in the jail, right? Correct. And from there, you went on patrol, and you did patrol for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> are you the type of guy that enjoys the patrol life, getting out there, pulling cars over, doing the dirty work, or, or do you like what you do more now? Uh, I'd have to say I prefer what I do more now. I thought when I was on patrol, that was my gig, and I thought I'd be doing that until I retired. Um, and then once the detective bug hit me, I, I don't think I could go back, to be honest with yeah. you. It would, yeah. be, it would be a tough sell for me to go back. I imagine that it takes a lot more mental, um, mental work, being a detective, putting puzzles together, so to speak, than, than being out on patrol. Oh, absolutely. I think um, even though we're still reactive, there's a lot of proactive strategy thinking. Uh, you have to consider everything on a case. Um, you know, just for example, on doing a, a major case, just writing the press release, I don't think people can really appreciate the four or five lines that, that show up in a newspaper or on the news, um, you know, in, in some sort of an interview or something. That's very well thought out and everything just to make sure that the integrity of the investigation and the respect to everybody who's involved in the, in the investigation um, is paid. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot more than what I anticipated when I got in there. It's a lot of, uh, like you said, a lot of brain power. Uh, you got to think every move, every, every move has to be calculated. That's like some real art of war stuff right there, man. Um, I wouldn't have actually even thought about the press releases until you brought it up, but that's, that's a good point. Um, I imagine that <clears throat> using a lot of verbal judo is something that would be kind of important in detective work. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is also, I mean, besides from, you know, that mental warfare aspect of things, strategy, um, how do I elicit information from somebody, which, again, very James Bond, you know, um, but also like things you and I were talking about uh, in the seminar, Ed had us do something where we were, you know, basically looking for cameras, looking for entrances, exits, things like that. And right away, you were firing on all five cylinders with it. So I, I hit you up questions. Is that something that you, you typically do kind of a lot on the job where you're kind of automatically looking at, okay, What's the lay of the land? How could I get in here if I needed to? I, I think as a general rule, I mean, um, I wish I could say I was 100% turned on to all that stuff all the time. There's sometimes that, to be honest with you, I'm just so mentally exhausted. I just am, am just trying to get to point A, you know, from point A to point B. Uh, but I think as a general rule, when, when I need to use those and, and, you know, something in me says I need to be paying attention to that stuff, I generally am. Mm. So. Yeah, I imagine a little bit more than patrol um, detective would be would lend itself to to looking at the lay of the land like that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I well, I, I think it depends on on what's going on. Uh, to a patrol guy, I think, you know, when when people are out on the streets working patrol, there's uh, number one, I'm actually a little bit less visible because I'm driving around in different vehicles. I'm not wearing a, a uniform, so the patrol person out there, uh, you know, pushing a black and white they're they've always got a target on all the time, potentially. Um, so their security concerns might be a little bit different from mine because I can blend easier, you know? Yeah. So whereas with them, they can't. Now you, you bring up, you know, the fact that as a patrolman, you do have a target on your back. Um, anyone in uniform, honestly, these days, 
but especially right. patrolmen. The political climate right now, I wouldn't say political climate, but the climate in general, there's a lot of threats out there, man. I mean, could you give some of, some of our guys and girls out there listening some personal security tips that you've kind of accumulated over the years that, you know, we're walking down the street, we're in a, whether we're in a city, whether maybe we're in just a town, um, people got to watch their back, man. Now, what do we, what do we want to look out for when we're walking around on the street? Uh, well, kind of everything and anything. I mean, you never know where something's going to come from, but at the same time, that'll burn you out. So yeah. uh, I think I think one of the things is having a realistic look at how the world operates and understanding violence and avoiding it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you enough that, uh, you know, I've been a firearms trainer for a long time with my agency. And one of the first things that I, I teach the guys is the best confrontation is the one that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that is... Uh, when you're out and about is, is just paying attention to all the danger signs that you possibly can. And it, it's dependent on where you, where you live. You know, um, I live in a fairly rural area. So um, my security concerns are a little bit different than somebody who's li you know, living in an inner city or something like that. Um, so it's just basically paying attention to your surroundings. And if something doesn't feel right, avoid it, you know, try and figure out some other way to, to get around what you have to. Yeah. Using your intuition is a big thing. I always work yeah. on that especially with women, because they seem to have a little bit better intuition than us guys. Yeah, I, w I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> so would my girlfriend, man. <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> talking about intuition, okay, this is, this is something that, you know, like I said, we harp on it here at Gutter Fighting Secrets. And seasoned guys like you, I, I, always, I always get a chuckle because you guys know it all too well. Have you ever been in a situation where your intuition is kind of telling you one thing? And maybe you don't want to listen to your intuition and it turns out to be that it was a hundred percent correct. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I imagine uh, working a case. I, I had one situation where. No, please go ahead. Oh uh, yeah. I had one situation where that, uh, that saved my life. I, I was, I did not want to, uh, uh, walk up to a house and uh, everything was telling me not to do it. And then I found out that later on that uh, something was waiting for me on the other side. So I'm wow. very glad that I listened to that intuition. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about, man. And, you know, if you hadn't listened to it, if you had told yourself, whatever, you know, you, <laughs> fuck, you might not be here. Um, that's, that's key, man. And I imagine that working a case, you know, sometimes your rational self or, or whatever might tell you, or even just a bias, you know, maybe you've got some kind of bias towards something and something tells you, well, no, 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 no. But that little voice is telling you, no, that's correct. That's correct. Um, how, how important is it when you're putting the pieces together in a case? Um, is it to kind of listen to that little voice in your head? I think it's crucial. Huh. I, I, I really do believe that. And I think huh. uh, anybody that works with me would probably, <laughs> would probably reinforce that. Huh. I'm always harping on that. I think, uh, um, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a case and something's just nagging at me. I'll go home. I'll think about it. I'll wake up the next morning and, um, then all of a sudden something will just come to me. And it's that, that little voice that I'm listening to saying, Hey, we need to do this, or we need to look into this. And, um, you know, I, have seen a lot of other investigators and stuff that, that listen to that voice and, and, uh, you know, it, they find something that, that cracks the case. Uh, I was working wow. with one guy and, um, he just had a, a real big, um, feeling in his gut that he, we needed to go back and check something out. And sure enough, he went back and, and he located something that, that broke that case wide open. So if he wouldn't have listened to that voice, uh, I can tell you right now, just uh, with the, the circumstances of what he found, where it was at and when he found it, uh, if he would have been two hours later, we wouldn't have recovered that. So wow. um, I, I really believe in listening to your intuition, paying attention to that gut feeling. Almost every time I found myself in a bad spot, um, I don't want to say every time, but uh, uh, I, I can tell you that I know when I've not listened to that little voice, I've usually gotten myself in trouble some way or another um, with tactics. So I, I really listen to that little voice. That is something that I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's just so valuable. And guys and girls listening at home, all the GFS family out there. I just, I want you to put that in your pipe and kind of meditate on it, smoke on it a little bit because it's really, I'm glad you brought that up, Nick. And I'm glad you said that. Now, 
you and I were talking, you try to get to at least one training course a year, uh, which I think is amazing. Um, what makes you, and actually it might be more than that. Was it one year or was it a couple of years? Uh, well, I actually go through quite a bit of training every year. Um, probably several hundred hours every year. Um, wow. I, I don't, I, uh, I, I couldn't tell you from year to year, but it's, it's a lot. Now, is that all department training or is that stuff that you, you go through on your own? A uh, little bit of both. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, I think it's so awesome. And it's one of the reasons, main reasons actually I had you on the pod, podcast, man, is because I meet a lot of cops and, you know, in my line of work, firefighters, even EMTs out there who they go through what they're being paid to go through. And that's it. Uh, when I meet a guy like you, it, it's a kindred spirit almost. And you realize that, hey, people rely on us, right? People rely on you to solve these freaking cases, to protect and serve. You take what you're doing to heart. You take what you're doing seriously. And, you know, for you to go and spend your own personal time, in some cases, um, doing this stuff and training is, it's far above and beyond. How much of that pays off in the end? Oh, I, I think it's invaluable. Uh, I never got into this job for for anything like, uh, you know, just a paycheck or something like that. I wanted to, I wanted to get the most out of this job. And, um, you know, the, the younger Nick stake in the Academy just wanted to drive cars and kick indoors and catch bad guys. And then I, as I got older and learned how the, the world works, uh, I really do feel like being a law enforcement officer is one of the best ways that you can give back to your community. Um, you know, as perfect example is, uh, when I was pushing a black and white on the streets and, and going from call to call, I got to drive my car really fast with lights and sirens on. And I feel like it was my duty to uh, to make sure that I was doing that safely because that was something that was entrusted to me. I, I had fun doing it just about every time. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to make sure that I got the most out of it. So that's kind of how I view training and, and my career. It's it's a different personality, man. It really is the samurai spirit that you're you're doing going out there doing that. It, it and I appreciate it just as as a citizen, even though I don't live in your jurisdiction. It, it's it's appreciated. Well, you, my Thanks. friend, are uh, I gotta say, you're an expert lock picker. I've never seen anyone open locks as quickly as you did, and all different kinds of locks. Is this something that you practice on regularly, or is it just kind of a natural thing? Uh, no, it was something I picked up a couple years ago, and I just uh, anytime I was sitting there, I just start working on a lock. Okay. And uh, I appreciate you saying I'm an expert lock picker, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how good I really am compared to some of the stuff I see on YouTube. But uh, uh, but yeah, it's it, and it just became a hobby, you know. And not only that, but there was a lot of times on the job where uh, I think we did stuff more brute force. When uh, looking back on it, I could have just used a lock pick and got in without causing any damage, you yeah. know. Now everyone so, wants to everyone wants to kick that door in, you know. Everyone wants to take the halligan and get the hell in there. But do you yeah. think that muscle memory and repetition is a big thing when it comes to not only lock picking, but you know, training in general? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I study a, a lot of different disciplines, and one thing I can tell you is I really notice if I'm not working at that skill. Uh, I, I can pick it back up when I start working on it again, but once I drop it over time, I, I definitely am not as refined as I am when I'm working on it all the time. So like right now, um, you know, if I were to pick up a lock and, and pick it, uh, you probably wouldn't think the same. I'd, I'd get through it, but it would take me a little bit longer than I did in class. So. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things, dude, where <clears throat> if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. People who study language Absolutely. will say that too. Um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And uh, I know that you've done a lot of actually firearms training, not only personally, but like you said, you're, you're responsible for firearms training for your agency. And uh, you actually were also thinking at some point, maybe after retirement, on uh, going to work for the private industry doing that as well. Um, so I would imagine a guy like you, if you pick up a firearm after not going shooting for maybe a month, two months, three months, you get busy or whatever, I mean... I imagine you're still pretty much able to operate that thing with the efficiency of, you know, of somebody who's put their time in. Now, do you think that there is a time decay on that? However, like if you didn't shoot for a whole year, do you think you'd be good as good as if you didn't shoot like for three months, let's just say? Uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, uh, 
you know, being a firearms instructor, I sometimes have not shot for extended periods of time because I'm always the one teaching and yeah. everybody else gets to shoot. And I could feel myself as far as my skill level degrade, uh, but I've never let it go that long. So I don't know how bad off I would be. I'd like to think it wouldn't be too terribly bad since of all the, you know, tens of thousands of rounds or however many I've fired in my career. Um, but for, for sure, I mean, uh, I could feel it and I know where I I'm at and then I know where I used to be. And sometimes that's a little frustrating for me when I'm not performing, like I know I can. Yeah, no, especially, I mean, guys like you and me, man, when, when, when we know what we can do, but we can't do it right at that moment, it, there's nothing worse in my opinion. Now, when you, um, when you're training guys to shoot, I mean, you're training guys to shoot, to live basically. And, uh, What would you say kind of are the most, if you had to pick two or three of the most fundamental yet most important skill sets as far as shooting to live, what do you think that those might be? Uh, Well, the first skill set is uh, working out the muscle in between your your ears by far. I think that, uh, I think a lot of times in the firearm training realm, we get a lot of focus on, uh, doing all these cool tactics and everything like that, but we don't actually think through the chess game that a lethal force or really any sort of violent encounter is. And I think I would rather, if, if I had to go through a, you know, a door with somebody, I'd rather have somebody who can think and perform under pressure reliably uh, than somebody who has all their skills perfectly polished and then they totally crumble. Um, mm. I've seen both sides of that coin. So I think by far uh, developing the mental skill set to go with everything is uh, the, the number one thing I, I like to preach about. And then the other thing is all the fundamental skills. Um, I think we like to get fancy, like I said before. I prefer working on the fundamentals, you know, proper uh, execution of a trigger press. Uh, you know, the red dots are coming in. So side alignment is not quite as big as it used to be um, in, in some regards, but uh, just mastering those fundamentals and then uh, you know, squeezing in time a couple times a day to do, or a couple times a week, I mean, to do dry fire uh, practice or, or just working on some skill set, uh, a little bit of the skill set uh, over a long extended time. So I may only do five, 10, 15 trigger presses a week, but that's going to beat somebody out who um, does 500 trigger presses at the end of the year and then doesn't do it again for three months. So I, I prefer uh, kind of getting into that flow where I do a couple things here and there on a repetitive basis, you know, with limited time span in between and, and keep up my skill set that way. I hope that answered your question. No, it absolutely did. And I always hear instructors talking about the importance of dry fire. Um, how important is dry fire? Uh, to me, I can, uh, I can tell you if I don't dry fire, I notice, I, I, I <laughs> can tell. Um, I, I, I really, I instill in, in all my guys that dry fire is important because like you said about the repetition, um, executing that trigger press in stressful situations is, is fundamental and you have to do thousands of those to be proficient, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Muscle memory, you know, like you're, like you're saying, dude, muscle memory. If you don't, like we, we've been talking about, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and when you're going through a door, and I imagine that you go through doors in different ways. Um, but if you're going through a door when you think there might be some stuff on the other side, you know, what is going through your head? Is there any ways that you can kind of mentally calm yourself down enough to operate smoothly before you, before you execute something like that? Um, for me, it's just uh, focusing on the task at hand. To be honest with you, everything, uh, if I've got a long time that I've got to think about what I'm about to do, it kind of, I kind of get a little jacked up. But to be honest with you, when I'm whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm kind of just going through the motions. Um, and then afterwards, if I have time to sit and think about what just happened, that's usually when I start, uh, uh, you know, kind of going over things in my head and stuff starts to catch up. But uh, when everything's going on, for the most part, I would say uh, most of the things I've done throughout my career, I, I've just been in the moment. Yeah. Huh. So stay in the moment. Don't think about it too much. Follow your training. Follow your intuition um get it done and then (laughs) think about it later basically yeah pretty much that's that's how i've approached everything (laughs) well you're still here and you're talking to us now so it it must work (laughs) so Uh, 
I've got a few years to go. So hopefully I'm knocking on wood for you too. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> now I know that you are closing in um, at some point here on retirement, man, any, I, I know you and I were thinking about it, um, talking about it. Any, any further thoughts on what you, what you might want to do when that time comes? Oh, geez. I don't know. Everybody keeps asking me that and I just can't figure it out yet. I don't know. Uh, and I'm one of those guys too. I, I, I kind of just, I, I, the Lord will provide, so to speak. So I know that when the time comes, something will fall into place and I'll have my answer and I'll just know it's right. So uh, I know like we had talked about me getting into the firearms industry. I'm a realist too. Uh, there's tons of people out in the firearms industry. So it's a very competitive market. Um, so maybe that's in my future. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be something else. I'm not sure. But that when the time comes, the right thing will pop up. I want you guys to pay attention to what Nick just said. Again, spoken like a very much like a samurai of old. When the time comes, th- something will come up. Talk about staying in the moment. Talk about following your intuition, man. You know, that's that's the good way to think. I, I really admire that. Um, what about training, man? I mean, what what's next for you? I mean, outside of kind of department training, any any specialized training coming up for you that you got your eyes on the horizon for? Um, I don't know. I mean, I always just try and push the envelope in, in all the different trainings. Um, uh, do a lot of repelling and stuff like that. I think I'm going to start getting into that a little bit more, uh, probably go through some, some, uh, some more of that. Um, but yeah, everything else is just kind of going to the next step in all my training, whether it be the investigative training, tactical training, uh, man tracking training, whatever it is, you know, I'm just going to just keep pushing on that and see if there's anything new or whatever, something to push my, push my envelope a little bit further. So oh, yeah. anything and everything pretty much. Awesome. Awesome, man. Now, <clears throat> I want to ask you this. <clears throat> we specialize here, obviously, in martial arts, hand to hand combatants. In your opinion, for, you know, whether it be a patrolman or whether it be someone more specialized like yourself, detective work, how important do you think hand to hand fundamentals are? Uh, I, I think it's crucial, uh, especially, uh, you know, for me being a detective, I think one of the hardest things for me to get used to was I had to give up all my tools. As a patrol guy, I had a taser, a baton, OC spray, which as I got older and, and uh, I started uh, carrying less and less of that because it was too much of a burden on my back. But um, and not only that, but, uh, you know, I always try to focus on on kind of the verbal judo that everybody talks about. Um, but uh, being a detective now, pretty much I don't carry any of that stuff around with me. So uh, I have to be got to stay in fairly good shape and I have to keep my skills up with that because I don't have any other tools other than uh, my brain, my hands and my, my firearms. So when you're going out on the job day to day, what is a typical loadout for you? Is it just your, your weapon? Do um, you carry any flashlights, a pocket knife, anything like that? Uh, well, yeah, I've got the stuff that everybody can see on my belt, but then there's always a couple potential hidden secrets else, elsewhere yeah. that I'm not going to reveal, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so there may or may not be something there. Who knows? <laughs> All right. I'll leave it at that then, man. Um, I want to ask you about this, though. The uh, <clears throat> the baton, man. Police, infamous police baton, whether it's a collapsible baton or one of those old school PR24 things. Um, what do you think about those? Are they are they any good? Uh, you know, I, I can't speak from experience. Uh, I never had to use mine. And it was probably for the best. I don't, uh, um, I, I don't know. We call it a baton, but to me, it's a big stick. And, uh, you know, I mean, I knew guys that it was effective for them, but it, I just never used one in, in uh, uh, going on almost 20 years. I, I never deployed it and used it on the job. I always used another tool or my hands. So um, I can tell you, I did see some, um, uh, with the collapsible batons, uh, when they started carrying the lower mass batons around, I would see people get into an altercation and, and try and take somebody into custody and they just weren't effective, uh, because they just didn't have the mass and, and, uh, you know, a couple of times maybe strikes weren't delivered, uh, you know, in proper locations, just because of the, the nature of the altercation that was going on, uh, suspect moved or, you know, uh, 
missed a target or something like that when the strike was going in, but I, I just never been fond of them. So I'm probably the, the worst person to ask about batons. <laughs> you know, I've always, I've always kind of felt a similar way. Um, <clears throat> obviously I've, I don't think I've ever actually used one either, but um, it's, it, it, it just doesn't seem like the most practical thing. You know, uh, I, I feel like maybe grabbing someone up or, you know, even giving them a, a burst in the face of that OC spray that you guys carry might be a little bit more effective. Yeah, like I said, I, I mean, I can see a couple um, situations where batons would be indispensable, but for the most part, like I said, I uh, being a rule guy, I never really went to it as a first as a first option. Um, never, never used one. It's the it's the way that well, it's the liability too. I think you the way you guys have to use them and the and the the areas that you have to strike, whether it's the thigh or whatever. I mean, it would be different if you could just crack them on the head with it, right? But <laughs> you can't do that, so not uh you know not usually at least what about oc man do you, have you ever have you ever had to deploy any of that i uh, have and um it just made everybody really upset and then i ended up getting into a hand-to-hand -hand confrontation with them and then they were covered in oc and i was covered in oc so i have seen effective deployments but uh just my luck i i didn't have any of those so um that was one of the tools i used a couple of times and it kind of went to the wayside yeah yeah I, I've had a similar experience with the OC myself where, uh, you know, it seemed like a good idea, but it turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat instead. So um, flashlights, all right? I'm going to just go down the checklist here. What do you think about these tactical flashlights everybody's carrying around these days? Uh, I think they're good. If they're a uh, high-quality flashlight that's actually built for the job, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is I'll get uh, – people coming through classes or something like that and they'll have a flashlight that's really bright but it's not actually built for um you know actual work the, mm -hmm. the switch isn't designed correctly um doesn't throw light out the proper way um stuff like that so i think uh, to be honest with you uh, i think a, a good flashlight is indispensable so yeah, I imagine, especially even even with what you do now, um, having a, just a nice pocket flashlight on you would be a really handy thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there any particular style of martial arts that you like to train in? Is it like boxing or is it judo or? Um, so obviously the jujitsu thing has kind of gotten into law enforcement and that's kind of taken over. Um, I had a good friend of mine that studied martial arts for a long time that I, I trained under uh, for a couple of years uh, before he ended up retiring. And uh, so I would say that's primarily where I come from. Uh, you know, the other thing, too, is kind of being a smaller guy. I'm not exactly the, the, the biggest uh, cop out there. Uh, every time I I'd get into some sort of physical altercation, it was uh, a mixture of that. But um, it was also... Uh, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of a street brawl too, because wearing duty gear, a vest, a belt, all that, that kind of stuff, you can't execute some of the moves that are traditional martial arts moves. So it was kind of just a combination of everything I had picked up. So, um, but I would say probably, um, you know, the most background I have is probably in the jujitsu and I don't, uh, I don't claim to be anything special in that by, <laughs> by any stretch of the means. It's so effective. I mean, <clears throat> jujitsu is just, it's so effective. And you got some guys out there in the reality-based community who claim, oh, I would just punch him in the bulls or I would gouge his eyes or whatever. But I mean, you know, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that if you've got someone and, and you're wrestling around with them, especially on the ground or especially in, you know, close quarters like you guys do, I would imagine, you know, no, just knowing how to get positions on guys is, is really indispensable. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and that's the whole thing too, is I think a lot of people don't realize that our whole objective is, is to establish control. It's, it's not to injure or do anything like that. So, I mean, to be able to um, be in an altercation and have somebody basically fighting with you with no, no rules, um, you know, and then from my perspective, trying to maintain control of that person or gain control of that person and get them in handcuffs or, or stop some sort of a threat. I mean, that's, that's uh, very difficult to do. And they teach you guys, I think in the Academy, a lot of like arm bar takedowns and things like that, you know, joint manipulation. Um, 
Is any of that stuff, have you ever found it very effective or? Uh, no, and I think one of the things that's happening now is there's some new programs that are coming through and, and changing that. I think there's going to be a big paradigm shift in mm -hmm. uh, the defensive tactics or arrest control techniques that I was taught when I went through the academy to what the guys are going to be getting now mm -hmm. coming in. Um, because I can tell you, I, I was an instructor in that for a lot of years. And uh, barring, you know, I, I well, I guess I would say probably about 10 to 15% of that program, I actually was able to use all the rest was not very effective. Yeah, yeah. So um, it never really got used. I'm glad that they're, I'm glad that they're going to change up kind of the way that they're training their guys. Because, um, you know, like you said, you know, I'm sure there's value in everything. Um, they wouldn't, they probably teach it, you know, uh, if some of it didn't work or whatever, but you know, it, it just seems like jujitsu is a little bit more effective. Um, and you know, I don't claim to know much about um, handcuffing people or whatever, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's a better techniques out now than there were back in the day when those programs were, were invented. Yeah. Well, and I think too, um, one of the things that we need to focus on is, uh, you know, with the jujitsu and everything like that, we kind of glamorize going to the ground, but as a cop, you don't want to go on the ground. Um, you know, if, if I start rolling around with, with somebody, I'm not a huge guy. Um, I, I don't want to get into that situation. I really want to avoid it. I want to stay on my feet. I want to stay mobile. Um, so I think that's one of the downsides to some of the programs that are coming out is they're not focusing on, you know, uh, getting off the ground, getting back up and, uh, you know, staying mobile. Mm. Uh, we kind of glamorize being on the ground a little too much, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, that's actually a really good point. And I'm sure that you guys also have to kind of look out for, hey, if you if you go to the ground, I was talking with one guy who was in prison and he said, well, if he ever went to the ground or any anytime he saw somebody go to the ground, they got shanked. So I'm sure that's something you guys have to look out for quite heavily as well. Oh, yeah. 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 That's not a fun experience. I imagine it wouldn't be. I imagine it would not be. Um, yeah. And I mean, as far as knife defense, man, I mean, is, is there any of that stuff that you've ever learned that you, that you think you would, that you would bet on that you would place your, your security in? Uh, uh, in what way, I guess would be my question to, to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, good question. So there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, grab the knife, twist it, do this, do that. Um, but I've just always kind of felt like it, it may be better to have, a knowledge of, you know, defending empty hands versus a knife, but I, I've always also kind of felt like the reality of a, a street fight, life or death kind of struggle against the knife specifically might be a little bit different than what you're learning in, in the dojo, so to speak. Uh, I agree. I think, to be honest with you, all the time that I was out on patrol, I was more scared of knives than I was firearms. Mm. Um, it's just so brutal. Um, it can be used um in a much more concealed manner and uh you know anything any any edged or pointy weapon can be used with a lot of those techniques and and uh you know you get up close and personal you're gonna get cut you're gonna get stabbed it's gonna be brutal and uh it's it's not anything like what's in the movies so uh yeah that's something i don't like to tangle with to be honest with you yeah i, I would imagine if you can shoot the guy that'd be a lot of better option <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, once, once you get forced into that situation, it's, uh, you either got to get away or it's, it's going to get brutal. I mean, it's, there's knives and, uh, or edges and points flying around. You're going to get cut. You're going to get stabbed and, and, uh, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of injuries very fast with a knife. I know I've investigated a lot of, um, you know, incidents involving knives and, and the people are stabbed multiple times, you know, um, slashed multiple times and uh, just a lot of injuries. So. Do you think that being a detective looking at violent situations actually gives you kind of more of an edge um, in dealing with violence? Uh, yeah, because I think you can identify it faster and therefore you can avoid it faster. Hmm. Um, little things that you see, um, way people carry themselves, uh, all that kind of stuff, uh, different behaviors. I think you can pick up on them a little bit faster mm -hmm. and 
and you kind of know the reasoning and the rationale behind them. So it helps you kind of avoid those situations. And then, uh, you know, by far, yeah, I, I think being a detective, especially seeing the end result of everything uh, when we're investigating a homicide or uh, attempted homicide or whatever, and, and you see how everything turned out for that person, um, it definitely gives you a, a very insightful uh, context. Yeah, I imagine it would. I, I imagine that actually takes your takes your skill sets up to the next level just by looking at case studies all day, which is fascinating. So speaking of case studies, man, um, I know we talked about this earlier, and you said that you hadn't really been following the Rittenhouse, Ritten, Rittenhouse training, uh, Rittenhouse trial at all. And I haven't been really looking into it too, too much earlier, but I've had several guys actually contact me and say, hey, could you, you know, find someone and get get some questions answered because the way that he's being kind of cross-examined, I think the term is, by the um, district attorney or the prosecutor, uh, it, you know, it's fascinating. And I've had guys really angry, like upset, contacting me and saying, look at what he's doing. He's trying to trick him and do this or whatever. And now I know that you're, you're a guy who's used to going on the, um, on the stand and dealing with probably both sides of the, the, um, the courthouse. Is there anything that, I mean, Lord forbid, somebody gets caught up, they do the right thing, they defend themselves, then they're sitting in court, which obviously is going to happen. What? Obviously, I don't want to ask you to give legal advice here, but in your opinion, what would be some good kind of things to keep in mind for anyone that had to use, uh, defend themselves, and now they're they're ending ending up in that area? Oh, geez. Um... (laughs) I don't even know where to begin with that. It's it's such a touchy issue. I think um, I think one of the things that people need to understand about the courtroom is that there's two sides to that for a reason. I think sometimes we pick and choose which side we want to win, but um, you know our nation was founded on a court system that allowed it to be um, uh, you know a, a, a check and balance, a kind of adversarial situation, and I think that going into something like that, you have to expect that it's not going to be a pleasant, a pleasant exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one side's going to try and seek to, to bring out facts in, in one manner, and the other side is going to seek to bring out facts in another. So um, I think anybody that gets involved in, in a use of force situation, um, it's, it's going to be a very um, uncomfortable experience when you're under the microscope and having to justify everything that you did. I would imagine it's the same thing for cops, man. I mean, we know when a law enforcement guy uses deadly force, I mean, he's going to be put under a microscope, just like the civilians out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, every single for- use of force encounter that I got into had to be documented. Um, you know, if there was any allegations about anything that uh, myself or anybody else in law enforcement does, you know, I mean, there's there's multiple um, checks and balances that that should be taking place at agencies to make sure that that force was used properly, or, or uh, uh, you know, the officer responded to the resistance of somebody appropriately. Um, so it's it's a very uh, complicated issue, and, and there's a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah. Well, like you said, you know, I'm, I I am glad you brought that up because our country was founded in such a specific way, and our our court system was set up that it gives you a better chance if you're in the right, at walking away from something with a clean slate um, than many, many other countries out there, I think. And, you know, the checks and balances like you brought up really is an important thing. And, you know, we should all feel lucky if, you know, if you're listening to this stateside to America, we should all feel lucky to be, to be Americans. Now, speaking of that, there's a lot of anti-cop sentiment out there right now, man. I'm just going to be flat out, you know, people, um, I won't even say certain people, just people in general, I think, are, are really pissed off, um, you know, and whether they take some of that out on the cops unjustifiably, and then some of it probably is justifiable as well. I mean, how does it, how does it make you guys feel, though? Like, when you're, when you're walking the beat, when you're going to your job, um, that's got to be in the back of your head somehow that, hey, like, a lot of people out there that might want to do us dirty. Yeah, I think uh, right now I'm lucky because I'm in an area where uh, law enforcement support is is pretty high um, at this point in time. And it's kind of always been that way. 
Uh, I couldn't imagine what some of the cops are going through in the bigger cities and, and some of the other areas. Um, but one of the things that I think we forget too is that it's not the first time America's been through this. Mm-hmm. You look back 60s, 70s, I mean, there was a lot of case law that was established. Um, you know, you look at the Kent State incident, uh, it was a demonstration and stuff went sideways and, and stuff changes the result. So um, I think that, uh, you know, the way the United States is set up, we're going to, this isn't the first time and it's definitely not the last time we're going to go through the, the, um, the political pendulum sp- swinging one way or the other. Um, mm. you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's, it's tough. I think for me, uh, I'm glad that my career is kind of getting towards the end mm. because of that. Uh, I kind of feel like I've done my time and I, I do want to get out at some point here in the near future. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that, uh, like you said, there's some, some sentiment out there that's, that's anti-police and, and in some cases that's probably been justified. And I think in other cases it, it's not. I think that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to be judged uh, based on the actions of one or two or a small portion of, of the law enforcement community where they've stepped out of bounds and abused their authority. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to be judged that way, but at the same time, that's the nature of the beast. I knew that going into the job. Yeah, and you're, you, you in some respects, I think, are, are kind of from the old school where you, you take very much black and white almost the idea of law enforcement where there's right and there's wrong um and, and you you from what i understand you try to you really try to err more on the side of right but is there ever a time man that i'm trying to ask this question in uh in the right way is there ever a time that a warrior has to step over the line and um walk in the gray area so to speak i don't think so Um, I think that if you take your job seriously, you take the service and and commitment seriously. I think that when it comes to doing anything where, um, you're going to push that gray area, uh, ethically, morally, uh, with any sort of integrity, that's, that's a hard line though for me. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, that it's kind of a cheesy saying, but with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, like I said, I've talked a lot about of avoidance, uh, being, I, I think that's one thing too, coming up as a sheriff's deputy, uh, you know, I've had to work in rural areas completely by myself. My backup sometimes was an hour or two hours away. Um, you learn how to treat people. Um, so that way you don't get into a confrontation. Uh, I had a lot of people who I arrested and they were not bad people. They just, you know, had a little cloud of judgment and um they they thanked me when they were done uh i you know uh i i think that's one thing that i'm very thankful that i came up in a community where um just based on my values and and the the type of uh uh upbringing that i had it kind of taught me how to treat people and and i applied that to law enforcement so um yeah for me it's it's uh treating people with respect i i i I remember one guy, uh, we, uh, we kind of had an altercation. He, uh, he attacked me and, and we, uh, ended up going to jail and, uh, dropped him off at jail and, and based on the car ride and everything like that, he apologized to me and, and, uh, you know, he said he was sorry for it. And I I think that says something, you know, um, uh, I call that one when uh when the da called me up i i actually spoke on the guy's behalf because i felt that he was genuine about what he said so i think i think the old school beliefs like that go a long ways um uh like i said i i i am kind of that i, I believe in the old school ways of a uh, handshake is is your bond and, and you treat people with respect and i think that uh you know carrying out this job like i told you it's it's kind of a privilege to get to do this and i would never do anything or want to have anything uh done in my career where i i push that edge and i have the opportunity to lose my job so um that makes sense it more than makes sense um you know you read uh yaguma nori and sun tzu and the old japanese chinese philosophers they they put so much importance in respect in honor in never doing anything to lose that honor um 
especially, you know, the samurai, much like modern day cops, it was a, it was a warrior class and it was a privilege to be able to serve your emperor, your community, all of that. And they would never even think about doing anything that would um, dishonor them or, you know, their higher chain of command. So it really is, it's cool to hear you say that. And, um, and I'm glad, and I, I just, I hope that anyone else out there listening, you know, no matter what you do, but especially if you're in civil service, guys, take, just take to heart what Nick is saying, because it's, it's so important. And, um, you know, that, that really is a good way of thinking, treating people the right way, treating people the way you'd want to be treated um, to the point where, I mean, that, that's a cool story, man. When the guy, the guy lost his, lost his head, you know, he attacked you. And then he was like, sorry about that, man. You know, I was just being a, being an idiot. It's, it's the way that you treat people. It really is. Cause I don't think a lot of cops would get an apology like that. I, I don't. Um, Nick, dude, it's been such a pleasure having you on, man. Um, I, I'd love to have you back on at some point. If you ever get the time, um, it would be cool to have you back on tech, talk a little bit more about, you know, you know, tactics, weapons, all that cool stuff. But, you know, thank you so much for coming on. Man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Pleasure for real. So, um, Guys, until next time, I want you to remember that you are your first and the last line of defense. Um, stay on the lookout, guys. Uh, at some point, Nick's going to be retiring, and there might be some training opportunities coming up. So stay in touch with me, and um, you know, if you guys are interested at all, we'll go from there. So I will catch you guys in the next Tactical Podcast.